sure. problem number one. What's yeah, I, problem number one? I think everything you can trace and that's a problem in the system, you can trace back to debt. And this is, I think, this is the most interesting slide that I've seen over the last few years, certainly since the crisis began in 07, 08. So what you see here is a chart of net foreign assets of various countries as a percentage of their GDP. So every time a country gets into difficulty in borrowing, it's invariably the foreign borrowings that cause the problem. Because clearly, if you've got a printing press, you can just print your way out. And clearly, a lot of the Eurozone can't do that today. So that's one reason why the Eurozone's really systemically uh, you know, vulnerable. But what you see here is, I think it's fascinating, the most objectively creditworthy countries on the basis of net foreign assets are all not the usual suspects. So the likes of Qatar, Singapore, UAE, Russia, even China, even. All the countries that are most problematic, you can see on the, on the far right on red, well, two of them have already defaulted, Iceland and Greece. And this is kind of like a roadmap. You can see who's going to be next. And it's going to be the likes of Portugal, possibly New Zealand, possibly Spain, a lot of the Eurozone. This is, I think, it's a fascinating way of looking at the debt market. And the UK? The UK and the US are both about here. So they, they're in the same. They're not. They're not. They're not in. The, they're not in the danger zone. They're not in the sort of emergency ward yet. But they're, they're not. They're certainly not as pretty as these guys. Yeah, but the UK and you know, Ireland. UK and Ireland. It's roughly UK, Ireland, and Italy all sort of rubbing shoulders. Is that something which is? That's not something you necessarily think about. You think that the UK was much stronger. This is true. Uh, You'd think it was so in, in a better state. But I think what, what, what's inter most interesting about this chart are the extremes. You can see it sort of at a, at a glance where, where the money is and where the money is likely to go. Because the, the second application of this chart, I think, is that from a currency perspective, in a deleveraging world, the countries on the far right need to attract capital. And the way they'll probably choose to do that is by devaluing. So if you were a currency trader, you might well, taking a medium term view, you'd basically short the red countries in as much as you could. So Australia's, the best, Australia's probably the best one there. Or, the, or New yeah. Zealand, yeah. The, the sort of Kiwi. Yeah. And then you'd go long. Those, those countries in green that have a free float, that have a, a free, freely floating currency. So it's an interesting roadmap. Brilliant slide. Let's go to slide number two. Problem number two. This is only going to get better. <laughs> yeah, the emergency exit. <laughs> Interest rates in their historical context, what is this telling us? Well, I think it's just telling us that you know, we've never been in this kind of a, a pickle before. We're in unprecedented territory. So I, mean, I heard Paul saying that he thinks that U UK rates could maybe go lower, but there's a limit to how much lower they can go. Um, but at some point, this, this, this juggernaut, if you like, and it relates to the next slide, which is interest rates themselves. These, this is clearly a, a central bank levied rate. So this is in the control of the Bank of England. But if you look at market rates, which are also being suppressed, at some point they're going to have to turn. Uh, either that or we're just not living in a proper e economic model anymore. So when that juggernaut turns, I think the implications for a lot of asset markets, including stocks, they're going to be some really profound. Have you got any idea of how long it might? I mean, this is, is always the question. <laughs> is it, it always like a five-year call option on on interest rates? Is who it, knows? Is who knows? I mean, un unless you're privy to the innermost thinking of the likes of Janet Yellen and uh, uh, you know Mr. Carney, then who can say? It, but but it, it, at the moment, there's a, there's a sense that it's going to be lower for longer. But I just think this is like a, this is like a coiled spring. At some point, this sucker's going to blow. Well, problem number three. Let's go to the third chart. So again, this is just the market dynamic. And again, anyone piling into gilts right now is doing it at all time lows. Not a whole lot of value in that market, as I'd humbly suggest. I can't disagree <laughs> with that one either. And the fourth chart. Yeah, this is, this is, this is US stocks. So this is the uh, it's a quite popular sort of uh, Schiller CAPE, the cyclic adjusted PE, basically 10 year smooth PE uh, for the US, for the S&P 500. Long story short, we've only really been more expensively priced in, in US large cap stocks, two points in history. One was 1929, the other one was 2000, neither of which was a particularly auspicious time to be long US equity. But a little bit, a little bit of upside still could be... Absolutely. But again, it, it all comes down to this sort of repression environment. People are piling into stocks because they've frankly got no other choice. Uh, I, I just don't think, I think we've seen how this, this film ends. So the, cure, well. so the cure is actually worse than the disease in terms of there's no way of getting out of this in a clean fashion. Well, the way I look at it is, the way I'd express it is that you've got effectively a sort of battle royale between government on one hand, government and central banks, and the market. The market wants deflation. Gov heavily indebted governments and central banks clearly cannot afford. It's an existential threat for them. They clearly cannot afford to have deflation. So whatever happens in the short run 
clearly deflation seems to be in the ascendant, I think the long run part is clear. It's going to be an inflationary mess. Well, the only thing, I mean, like, we already have the example of, I mean, just to, to try and work out a nice scenario, we have the example of like, Japan, where we had the bubble bursting in 1990, and they've been able to sort of basically kick the can down the road for nearly 25 years. But they years. haven't resolved the debt problem. Well, yeah, but, right. yeah, but it's like, you know, it's government debt. You can sort of put it to one side. People are still sort of, they're not starving in the street. So this could go on for quite a long time. I, I absolutely agree. The difference with Japan, though, is a very West socially <coughs> cohesive culture. The, those guys are stoic. When it comes to making those kind of sacrifices, I'm not convinced that we have the, the bottom, frankly, mm. to, to tackle that. that. OK, so talking of Asia, let's go on to the last chart. This is a bit of good um, news. So uh, this is an so four problems and one bit of good news. Well, well, one possible solution. So this is OECD forecasts for the growth of the middle class as they define the middle class over the next 20 years. Long story short, US doesn't really grow, but it's, a, it's at a fairly you know, mature level anyway. Europe is stagnant as well, but there's one part of the world where the middle class population just explodes if, if the OECD is correct. It's called Asia, probably already accounts for nearly half the world population anyway. So that, that population of newly wealthy people is going to grow from something like 300 million today to something like 2 billion people. That will be the single largest, if it, if it comes to pass, will be the single largest creation of wealth in human history. That is clearly a, an attractive secular tailwind story. How does the movie end? Uh, I think it depends where you are and uh, where you are on this map. I think if you're over there, it so ends it's, quite it's, well. So it's going to be different endings to this movie. Uh, yeah, I, I, I put it this way: I, I don't see a whole lot of reasons for optimism in like classic G7 markets. But I think if you're either invested in Asia or resident in Asia, I think it's a better outcome because they've got all the good stories. They've got better demographics, healthier banking system. They've got no heavily overburdened welfare state. What's not to like about that story?